Hello and welcome everyone um, to NEPCARE Kidney International's NEPCARE U educational webinar today on the kidney friendly diet. My name is Kristen Hood and I'm NEPCARE's Director of Clinical Outreach. I'm going to be your moderator today along with Rebecca Cook and Kylie Winkler. Um, a few housekeeping items today before we get started. Please remain muted during the entirety of this webinar. We don't want any background noise or distractions uh, during uh, Ms. Safina's presentation today. This webinar is being live streamed and recorded. Uh, it's live streamed to NEPCARE's Facebook page. So welcome to our friends who are joining us on social media today. I want you to know that we will be offering a Q&A session at the end of the webinar with, uh, with Ms. Safina. You may enter your questions at any time during the webinar. If you are joining us on from the Zoom link, there is a chat or a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that you can click on and enter your question there. Uh, if you are joining us from Facebook, uh, we will be also uh, moderating those questions that you might have from Facebook audience. So just go ahead and put your comment in your question into the comment section and we will try to answer as many as possible. I would like to finally thank our sponsors for making events like this possible. Today, we would like to thank Retrofin, the Pfizer Foundation, Chemocentrics, and Apellus for sponsoring our event today. So thank you so much for your support. And uh, now to introduce our speaker today, I would like to introduce Daniela Safina. She joins us today from Miami, Florida. Daniela is a licensed and registered dietitian and nutritionist. She's a graduate from the University of Miami with a degree in biology, and then went on and received her master's degree from the Florida International University. Daniela currently works as a dietitian at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And in 2017, she was awarded the Greater Miami Dietitian of the Year. So we have got a great uh, you know, host today um, with us. Thank you, Daniela, for joining us today and providing our patient community a great education today. So I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you, thank you, Kristen, thank you. Guys, I'm so happy to be here. We, as we were talking to them, we adapt to what we need to do. So it is a pleasure to be able to take you this education. You guys are home, you guys are safe, and you still, I'm sure, working on this, on this nutrition and on this diet at home. So this is a great time to be sharing sometimes with you. I hope you guys can hear me well and see me well. If anything, make sure to communicate it somehow so I get it a little bit better. So, okay guys, we are gonna spend the next uh, 20, I think 25 minutes talking a little bit about something that's very important for you and your diagnosis and your lifestyle, which is nutrition. Of course, I'm very passionate about it, not only because I went to school for it, but because I know the impact it has on your life. Um, after working uh, here in the hospital for many years, and spe specifically in nephrology, I've noticed how something that you guys do every day, every, multiple times a day, can have a huge, a huge impact on, on your lifestyle. So I'm going to go ahead and share this screen so you can see the presentation. And if it's not done correctly someone speak up if nobody speaks up i'm going to assume it's there okay so nobody's doing it okay guys we're going to be talking about nutrition generalized a little bit because those of you who are joining us may have different diagnoses may have different uh, conditions that you're dealing with different degrees of kidney disease um, different ages of course but we're gonna try to make it um, fit to all of you. So stop, have, please type the questions, send them over to them, and we'll review them after. I'm going to, give me a second to take this away from my view. Like that, all right. Okay, guys. So the first thing I want to uh, bring up, why is a nutrition regimen important? No, not only you eat about four or five times a day, 
Some, we take medications for these things. We go to the doctor, we take exams. We do all this kind of management for our kidney conditions and we don't do it as often as we eat. So we eat many, many more times than, than we do any other things in the medical in the medical aspect of our kidney care. So it does have a great impact and I want to review with you the reasons why it is important and the reasons why it can change the way you're living with your condition. So the first thing is that it's gonna make it easier for you to manage your condition, no questions. It's gonna make it easier to keep your numbers control. It's gonna get, it's gonna be easier to avoid complications and in the long run, it's gonna give you a better overall quality of life. So we're gonna jump on to this, I, I kind of summarized it for you in this three in this three keys. The first one is, why is it that I need this specific regimen? Most of my patients know they can't eat certain things, or they should avoid certain other things, or this is not good for them, or or this is better. But most of the time, they're not really sure why is that that has an impact on their health. They do know what a medication's for. They do know why they need certain tests for, but they don't know why certain things are avoided in their diet. So we're going to go that number one. Then we're going to go deeper into what it is that we need to do and need to prevent. And then lastly, uh, some steps to implement it into our daily life. So knowing why is it that you need a nutrition regimen or why is it so important? So there are many barriers or initial barriers when you first get diagnosed or years down the road of living with a kidney disease. The first one is that some of, some of you guys may lack a profound understanding of the nutrition that you need and the impact that it has. Some of you may believe it to the core. You know what? I just have limited choices. I, I have a very, very limited diet or I can't eat these. This is not something that I can do. Uh, oh, that, that's not good for me. And you just go on living with that kind of that kind of lifestyle some of you share a household with more people you have couples you have kids or you are younger and you live with your parents and then you have a household that has a completely different dietary lifestyle than you and then it's like no this is my diet their diet is different and uh lastly it looks difficult it sounds difficult and then there's poor compliance with the nutrition that you got that you guys are going to be benefiting from all of this thankfully are easy to solve and the best thing that you can do is approach a professional and take the time to talk to them to ask the questions. So we're going to start today with why is it that you need an appropriate regimen and this applies to all of you in the spectrum of a kidney disease no matter the diagnosis because all of them have this in common. The first one, you can get complicated with fluid. Sometimes fluid can accumulate, sometimes fluid can go away too quickly, fluid is gonna be an issue or it's gonna be something that you need to take care of while you deal with the kidney disease. So this is gonna have a direct impact on your heart health, on issues that can develop later, on the way you feel, your energy levels, headaches, energy, attention, all of those are linked to fluid and fluid is part of the diet. Number two, the certain numbers, certain values in your bloodstream go up and down as we deal with the disease and we de deal with the medications, I'm sorry, and specifically the lipids, the blood lipids go up and down really easily. And these are the number one reason why so many of us Americans deal with chronic conditions later in our life, 50s, 60s, 70s. And they are the number one reason for chronic heart disease, for strokes, for all these issues that we want to definitely avoid. Number three, and more specifically, if you're dealing with nephrotic syndrome, there, th the specifics of the condition is that because of that, you're gonna be losing a lot of nutrients in your urine, and those need to be replenished and managed and understood so that you're not affected by that. The number, number four, because of the medications you're in, because of the treatments you're receiving, you're gonna be more prone to gain weight. You're gonna get more prone to have misregulations with your blood sugars, and that puts you at a higher risk of developing diabetes, of developing insufficiency of insulin, of developing endocrine disorders, things that are gonna, again, worsen your quality of life. And then last, it is a diet that is given to you when it's not talked to as a lifestyle. So it can immediately feel like a burden to you and joining your life instead of this ruling your life. So these are the main things why we care about nutrition in your kidneys. And so we're going to go on to understanding the restrictions, understanding what is it that 
I need to focus on what I need to do. And mind you guys, I'm going to be talking about things that may not apply to you. I'm trying to make it general for the majority of the kidney population and more targeted to nephrotic syndrome. But again, some of these apply to you. All of these may apply. Some of, some of these won't. So the first one, sodium. We, we, we know about sodium. We've talked about it. And the first thing that most of you may think is sodium bloats me up. Or if I have high blood pressure, I know I can eat salt. So that's the first thing that you guys sometimes know. The first thing the doctors tell you, don't eat salt. Don't eat sodium that much. Okay, so what happens with sodium? It is not present or the most evident presence of sodium in our diet is not the most commonly addressed. So most of my patients, I know I don't add salt to my diet. I don't put extra salt when I cook. No, I don't cook with salt for my kids or for my husband with this condition. And ignoring that table salt, the one that we use, is not even the most important as a contributor to the salt in our diet. So yes, we know sodium is important. We need to know where sodium is coming from. So sodium is going to be used as a preservative, same as another product, another mineral that we're going to talk about. And with that, I'm going to keep track of the time here. So with that, sodium needs to be found. We need to understand when it's found. It's used as a processor. It's used as a preservative. And it's ideally labeled, as you can see on the screen, with this number of markers. Something is high in sodium, sodium-free, very low. Important for sodium, we need to know these numbers. If you want to take a, a picture of the screen, if you want to write it down, if you want to ask later for the girls and they're going to send them over it, all of this work. So marketing is a thing with food service and uh, the food service and the food industry does not really care about your kidney condition, but we do. So we want to try to go ahead and, and, and remember these things. We want to ideally have a number in our head. So I know I can avoid, I have to avoid sodium. What, how much do I need to eat? Your dietitian is there for you to give you, you know what, I want you to do 2,500 a day or 2,000 or 1500 and you work on that number and base after you get a number it's not only good to know i don't need sodium because you want to enjoy it you have a number and then you count most of these things you get from label so since sodium mostly comes from label you can calculate the majority of the sodium that goes in your diet make sure to really mean it's good enough for you it just means it's lower than the average product or it could even be this is kind of crazy it says that my connection on internet is stable it's unstable interrupt me if you guys get lost okay or if you lose me thing with this if you have a product a uh, commercial soup product that's in the market and it has 700 milligrams of sodium the food regulation allows that company to mark the product to be a low sodium product if it's just lower in sodium than the original product. So marketing is important. Read label is it, reading labels is important as well. This is number one for sodium. Potassium. Most of you or the majority of you know where to find it, and they ideally and, and, and very directly go to certain fruits, certain vegetables. They know I don't eat ketchup, I don't eat tomatoes, I don't eat pasta or pizza or bananas or potatoes or French fries. And good, those are the, 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 the highest sources of potassium. Potassium can be included in your diet. Potassium is needed in your diet. Yes, you can eat bananas, you can eat tomatoes, you can eat other fruits and veggies and include them up as long as you, again, know the numbers and know how to count. Um, I'm gonna just say a couple more times so you guys remember and don't miss it. I have available for you resources with numbers in it so that you know how much to count. Again, potassium can be given to you. A, a goal can be given to you. We're going to do 800 milligrams of potassium a day, 1,000 milligrams of potassium a day. And then that plus knowing how to read labels. At times, potassium is not always shown, but knowing, having a list in your phone. Now we have so much technology, the food labeling, knowing what kind of foods, how much they have. Counting up can allow you, can free up, can free up, can open up so many possibilities of yes, you can enjoy a, pl a plate of pasta, you can have a full avocado, you can have a banana shake, and you can have these things as long as you measure them and you have them control. And just as this, we have multiple ways of making cer certain restrictions fit for you. For example, the leaching of potassium 
in potatoes is one of the many options that we can do, not only with potassium, but with other foods that you can reduce the amount of potassium in the overall product. So you can, for example, most of you know them, uh, majority of moms know them because they do it a lot with French fries for the kiddos. You can peel the potatoes, you can take all the peel off, you can cut them, you can soak them in water and then follow these in instructions. You can Google this as well, how to leach potatoes off potassium. And the potatoes are gonna reduce almost 75% of the potassium that's naturally included in them. And you can enjoy them. You can have them in your diet. It's possible to put them in, which is great. So that's for potassium phosphorus. Phosphorus is a product that's one, very much present naturally in food and two, very much present as like sodium as a preservative for a lot of the products that you naturally found, find in, in stores. So out of the three, sodium, potassium, and phosphorus, I would say the hardest to manage is phosphorus. Not all of you thankfully have to control your phosphorus, depending again on the condition, on the disease, if you are on dialysis or not, if your nephrotic syndrome is more advanced, you may or may not need to to restrict phosphorus. Some of you may even need to have more phosphorus than usual. So it it's, depends again on you and your specific diagnosis. But in this case, phosphorus is found in the majority, in, no, in all of the animal products, all animal proteins, all meats, steaks, chicken, fish, seafood, all of those things have a lot of phosphorus. And then all of the protein products that come from plants have, have phosphorus all the grains, all the legumes, all the beans, then again, all the cereals, all the things that come from a similar, of a grain, something that's derivative of a grain. So phosphorus is very much present in everything. Then phosphorus is, as it is included in animal products, is present in milk, in milk and in all the milk products. Then it's also present in a lot of the, the as a preservative in a lot of our processed foods. So I would, I would, almost go ahead and say that the only products that you can safely consume that are low in phosphorus are fruits, vegetables, and I'm not including greens, like uh, beans, legumes, and grains, just plain veggies, water-based veggies, and then plain carbohydrates, the most refined, the, the whitest, white bread, white pasta, so the things that are not the best, the very best for you. So for phosphorus, it is key to find a way to put it into our diet because the best sources of phosphorus, high sources of phosphorus are usually the most, the, the healthiest options for you. You're going to need to eat some chicken and fish and seafood. You're going to want to have whole grains, whole, whole cereals, things that are naturally high in phosphorus. So counting here, knowing your limits, it's critical. If you use medication to control how much of phosphorus goes up and down also as well, very critical. Phosphorus is used as a pro, like as a conservative, as a preservative, but it's also used as a preservative that's not very evident in food labels. We call this hidden phosphorus. And it's we also use the word hidden because it is a product, it, this is products that you wouldn't think have phosphorus. We're gonna see examples later. But this is something that we want to read, a very quick, um, a very quick tip to, to read it, to find this. Since these are chemical products, it is mandated, mandated to have them on the labels. So if you identify the word phos, P-H-O-S, in your labels, that means the, the, there is phosphorus included in this ingredient. And the order in which you find them on the label means how much. So you always, every time you read the label, you have ingredients and then you have the lists of, of products that are in them. The farther away it is from the word ingredients, meaning at the end of the list, the least amount of phosphorus it's gonna be compared to other ingredients. So we wanna be careful with finding this uh, chemicals in our very common products. This is very much present in candies for kids, in flavored waters, in some of our um, energy drinks, uh, in pre-made mixes, things that we use commonly and we may think that they have, they don't have enough, but well, they're very much present there. I'm going to keep going here with fats. This is more targeted to two kinds of, two kinds of diagnosis. Nephrotic syndrome, very important, and then some of you who've been dealing with the kidney disease for a long time. Fats need to be very much controlled and monitored because you have, you're gonna have a high tendency to develop all the things cardiovascular related. All cardiovascular pro problems, you're gonna have more propensity to develop them if you don't control the amount of fats that you eat. Good thing is that 
it is an easy problem to fix. And most of my patients with nephrotic syndrome and problems with their heart because of the fat, because of the lipids, because of triglycerides, the cholesterol, and the HDL, the LDL, most of these problems, they treat them with medication when it is so much easier to treat them with diet and nutrition. So tips, very easy tips to follow a low fat diet, fried foods, humongously high in fat, specifically in trans fat, we don't want them. Fast food, pastry and baked goods, salad dressings, sauces, processed foods, fancy coffee drinks. Um, I wanna point out pastry, baked goods, and salad dressings because for a general kidney, a general patient with a kidney condition, these are things that you may go for. A pastry, salad dressing that's based on like a, a balsamic salad dressing, things of this source that sound like they are low in sodium, low in potassium, low in phosphorus, but then they're really high in this other product that is gonna make it worse. So far I'm sounding that there's nothing you can eat up. It's gonna get better, it's gonna get better. And the most important and where I want to focus the, the last part of the presentation is how do I, I already know what I cannot eat. I already, they've already given me so many times the list of the things that I'm not supposed to be consuming or adding in my diet. How do I make this work for me, for my family, for my children, if it's my children, for my social encounters, how do I make this work? So I'm going to give you three, this is a three things that I think work most for, for patients. And and this, guys, for those of you who sometimes have this struggle, you know what? My family doesn't doesn't have the same problem. It is it is a struggle for me to do it with my family because they, they they eat normal and I can't join in. I, they cannot join me. My diet's so much different. So the the recommended nutrition regimen for you dealing with a kidney condition, it's not very different from the regimen that we recommend to a healthier person. We want you to have healthy options of food and a healthy a, a renal diet can become a very healthy diet if we stop focusing on avoiding all the things that we cannot eat and we focus on okay what are my numbers how much can i eat of can i eat can i consume of each thing how much is that my my body tolerates of sodium of fluid of potassium of protein of phosphorus and of fats. How much of this? Give me numbers. Let me meet with a dietitian. I, I know what I cannot eat. I know the foods that I can eat. I want a list. I want you to calculate based on my age, based on my condition, based on my labs, based on my history. I want you to give me a number. And this is the best recommendation because based on a number, you can wait, you can uh, read labels, you can count, you can calculate and estimate, okay? I can still include certain things, even if, if they don't sound like they belong to a kidney diet. I can include a banana and an oatmeal and a bowl of cereal with milk in my breakfast if I do the right counting throughout the day, and even though I don't think that's possible. So number one, labels. Understanding labels from head to toe is gonna to be crucial because counting is what make it easier for you. In the long run, you're gonna stop counting so specifically and it's going to come more automatically you're going to you're going to almost know exactly how much and how many milligrams of things are in any product that you that you that you consume and you're going to also start noticing in foods when you go to a restaurant you're going to be familiar with the amounts with the weight with the with how much and how much you can allow yourself to consume in labels we check for all of them sodium potassium phosphorus if present and then we check of course for fat so that's very important and for sugar cooking Home cooking, this is a good time, guys, to enter into cooking mastery, into YouTube cooking skills, starting your own YouTube channel for renal disease at home, because a lot of people are staying there. You need to stay safe. We don't have that much to do outside. It's not safe, so stay home, cook, pull up a great recipe. We have a lot of resources for recipes that you can experience at home with, um, that it's gonna be the easiest way for you to know how much you put in and it's going to also help you exper like experiment with flavors, with herbs, with certain, certain spices that are going to add up so much more flavor and are going to make it so much more enjoyable. And it's going to be an easier way to introduce this kind of nutrition into your family. So you can cook things that are good for you. You can cook things for your children that are good for them if they are the ones with the condition. And then you can give it to the whole family. Eating like this, it's healthy overall. And then balance 
the diet, it's not here to, we're, we're not gonna give you a diet, a renal diet so that you can get a better help, health. We wanna give you just an overall healthy diet, an overall healthy diet that anyone in the house can follow. And with those guidelines, you can help your kidneys, not the other way around. So labels. We've t I know uh, I've talked to uh, with you guys before. We've talked about labels. I know you've received resources for this. Um, labels have been changing. This is the this is the most traditional label still commercially available in products. There's a newer version of labels. Both of them are still used. Um, labels are tricky. Marketing influences labeling, but we want to do go away with certain guidelines. Number one, everything in purple needs to click here with a number. So the percentages that are on purple are always gonna be always, no matter what you read, the amount, the product, if it's healthy, unhealthy, they're always gonna be related compared to a diet that is 2000 calories. So I don't eat 2000 calories a day. That is not the recommended amount of calories for me. Um, someone can consume 3,500 calories if you're in dialysis, if you just got in, if you're on the list for a transplant, depending on your statuses, you may be needing such a different amount of calories that are not even close to 2,000. So this number can change for you. So you need to know how many calories do I need? Again, going back for numbers, my dietitian, my nutritionist, my doctor, help me estimate how much is my, new, my, my energy expenditure. I want to know how much do I need. And then percentages understanding because it's very easy to say oh if five percent is low ten percent it looks like a low amount a ten percent for me can be a super high amount of sugar or a fat when a ten percent for a six foot one man with a different condition needs it, it's super low so it's not relative it's not relative and we need to know numbers we're going to focus a lot on yellow if you have nephrotic syndrome yellow is your spot we need to monitor the amount of fat trans fat needs to be ideally zero all the time if you find a product that is higher in trans fat or that has high trans it has trans fat in 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 the label which is now very uncommon we most of the products don't have them anymore consider them a cheap meal, a once in a while thing that you can consume and, and that's it. Baked goods are super high in this, by the way. Saturated fats, we wanna keep this as low as possible again, based on your number. A good number is five grams. Five grams is generally good for the overall population below that. And then a total percentage of fat for an average is gonna be a 15% of the calories. So not 15% on the label, 15% of the calories. So again, we need to know the numbers and this is very specific intricate work uh fiber we want fiber to be overall in our day five to ten to help us manage the conditions that we know we're at a higher risk we're at a higher risk of cardiac conditions and we're at a higher risk of uh, blood disorders of glucose control insulin and diabetes so this is going to help us overall and uh, for the vitamins and the minerals they're going to be shown sometimes in blue not in blue in your labels but they're in blue right now and those you need to be aware of how much you consume, especially vitamin D and iron and calcium for nephrotic syndrome, because those you tend to get rid of when you, when you urinate. I'm tracking the time, guys. I'm sorry. And the last one, if you see number five, says footnotes. So for those, sometimes in some labels, you can find the phosphorus there. It's not common, but you can find it. If uh, you don't find it, Google of nutrition label, it's gonna be very, it's gonna be very present. You can find all the nutritional context of all the food products, even if they're not a commercial product. You can go nutritional and you type nutritional fact or nutrition fact of green apple. And green apple, it's gonna, you're gonna open it up and it's gonna show you everything, including phosphorus, potassium, fiber, sugar, everything that you wanna know in apple, even if it's not a processed food with a label, you're gonna find it. And uh, so this is an overall for labeling. And this is a couple examples before we, we start wrapping up for, for labelings that, that you're gonna find um, conservatives or preservatives that, that have hidden phosphorus. So this is a very common mix. Of, I, I don't know how many guys have you used it, but it's very common here where most of us have tried them. And if you, if you read the ones highlighted, the products that are highlighted, it's more than one even. And it's, it's pretty much in the middle of the ingredient list. 
So just to clarify what I said before, if it says enriched bleach, we know that out of all those ingredients, enriched bleach, a flour, it's the one that is the most, uh, the, in the highest amount of all of those ingredients. Flour, because it's number one ingredient. And then egg, milk, eggs, and soy, or right before that, calcium carbonate is going to be the least compared to proportions. So sodium aluminum phosphate, and these two products that have phosphate in it are are there we need to know how much we we put of this how many products that we have at home have this have this uh hidden phosphorus especially if you struggle with phosphorus and you don't know why this is surprising all very often really surprised because it is a product that we see you know what is low in sugar no sugar no sodium no phosphorus no potassium and then no calories i can put this it gives me flavor uh it helps me with my you know with my fluid control and then this gives you more society well this is the, the number the fourth ingredient third or four, fourth and fifth ingredient are phosphorus and this is a liquid ingredient so the amount of phosphorus that it has is significant uh considering it's just water hidden phosphorus resources are available for you if you want them uh we've created one that's based on brands so for example, we have the brands of cereal that have hidden phosphorus, the brands of soy milk, almond milk, coconut milk, rice milk, the ones that have hidden phosphorus and one that, that, that don't. The, the um, brands of flavored water that do have them and that don't have them. So we do have this resource available uh, for you. And then for the last uh, couple of minutes here, this is, this is what, I, what I think is the most important. Though so you guys eat multiple times a day. So, and not only at home and not only to manage your condition, you guys go to restaurants with your couple, with your family, on your own, you cook at home and you enjoy a time at cookout at home, you go to parties, to social gatherings, you go to celebrations. So food is a very big part of our culture and it impacts directly our quality of life. If you've ever tried to even lose weight, just weight loss. I'm just talking weight loss. And you have known, I'm sure you have even yourself or your partner or somebody in your family or your friends that's trying to lose weight and it's always in a struggle in a social situation. Like, no, I can't eat that. Or you want a piece of cake? Like, no, I'm going to diet. And it's always a struggle to have any kind of restriction when you are in a social gathering. That's why I'm going to reinforce it today multiple times. The more you know the, your numbers, the more flexible your things are going to be because ideally there's nothing you should not eat. And this advice may come against many of the things that you've traditionally, I'm sorry, that you've traditionally heard before. So maybe you've been told you can't eat bananas, tomatoes. I'm giving the, same, the first example that's coming to my head. But um, I don't, this is not the way uh, we try to help our patients because we do want you, I want you to have everything, a moderation and in a balanced amount, which if we go back to just listening to those guidelines, it is the foundation of every, every single, this should be the foundation of every single one of us. Balance, portion control and amount calculation. I should eat like that, having or not having a kidney condition, and you should do it like that as well. So knowing a number, again, I recommend you go back to your specialist and get how much phosphorus can I have? How much potassium can I have? How much protein can I have? How do I measure it? Where are the lists? I need to know the numbers. So I start counting. How much fluid can I have? Very important. And um, just to, I'm gonna move this to the other side of the screen, okay. And a couple just thoughts to wrap it up. You're gonna have restricted items, items that you know are not good. The ones, for example, we said are high in trans fats. Those are gonna be your, ah, uh, I am not supposed to be eating that, but I like it. Uh, things like, I don't know, your, your witness, chips, baked goods, cakes, even if it's alcohol, things that you know are your, I'm not supposed to be eating this. I, I, wanna, I wanna have it anyways. So key, prioritize your list of restricted items based on their nutritional value. For example, you want to have, there is, a, this is the example I always use, there, the comparison between a very good, hearty, whole wheat, artisanal bread, which is high in phosphorus, high in potassium, which can be high in sugar at times, and then you have a pastry. And then you can have a very nutritionally packed breakfast or meal with your bread or with a cereal, 
because it has way more nutrients than you would get from the pastry, but they are equally restricted. Sometimes both of them are gonna give you the same amount of phosphorus, which is the thing that you're trying to avoid. Both of them are phosphorus. Which of this, in addition to the phosphorus, gives me the most nutrition? An example. Uh, then be clear on, again, your allowance, the amount. Write it down, research it, find out. If there's a, one of those parts that you're not, that you don't need to restrict or limit, great. If there is a restriction or a limit, have a number, find out a number. Sugar. Sugar is very many times hidden and in others used to complement something that you're gonna do. So necrotic syndrome patients are gonna, they're very encouraged to avoid fat. Go low fat, lower sodium, low fat, low sodium, lower in fat, a fat free, uh, light, these things. The food industry to compensate for the flavor that's lacking in the product because of the lack of fat are going to add extra amounts of sugar to the product. But of course, clever enough, they're not going to, if they put low fat item, they're not going to put in front, of, but high in sugar. Like they're not going to do that to you, but they're usually high. So it's even sometimes it is. Good that you read, let's say a product like a yogurt that you usually like, Do you enjoy a yogurt or a certain type of milk. It's not necessarily the best option always to just go straight blindfold, blindfolded to the low fat one. Low fat yogurts tend to be not as nutritionally appealing, not as tasteful, and they're usually higher in, in sugar. So I'd rather you have a more natural, normal amount of fat or reduced fat Greek yogurt with certain fruits that's going to be better overall in fat and sugar than a more processed, low fat, packed with additives, packed with sugar, healthier yogurt. So reading important there. So no added sugar is an option in labeling that lets you know that even though a product has no, no sugar added to it, honey, white sugar, brown sugar, anything sweet, this does not mean the product is not sweet. And this is something again about reading labels and the amount of grams of sugar that you have in the back. And then alternative supplementation, if you want to use uh, nat on natural sweeteners or then something that's sugar-free so that you can enhance the product without having to add more sugar to it. And then the last, and which I think is very, very new, it's, it's, it's more frequent now. Now we're using it more with the patients. I work mostly with the pediatric population, so using, it wasn't that, that common before, and now we're seeing it more often. Have your vitamin and minerals level checked. I know most of you guys know your iron, your calcium, and your vitamin D levels, but ask for all, the, once in a year maybe, or once every six months. Like I would like to know, especially in nephrotic syndrome, I wanna know how's my zinc, how's my copper, how's my, my, my vitamin C and my vitamin B12, my vitamin C, my folic acid. Those are minerals that are good, vitamin and minerals that you are gonna be naturally avoiding because you're restricted in your diet. And in compensation, they can be giving you a little bit more problems in the long term. So you wanna check them and know. And uh, we do have, this is a very new area. It's been going on for maybe the last five or four years using a holistic medicine and alternative medicine, alternative nutrition into diet and using supplementation, carnage supplementation, fiber, when you are not allowed to eat a lot, probiotics, and some other forms of products that can help you manage the problems that you have right now and to prevent the problems that you may have later in time. So there are many, many supplements that are good, very good in combination for renal and, and, and high risk of cardiac disease. Call it Co CoQ10 is one product, uh, carnitine is another product, omega-3 fatty acids. So these are great products to add on that overall, if you look at them from the outside, they're gonna be a help to all of the problems that you may be experiencing today and the problems that you may go in the, the risk, the high risk that you may be exposed to right now. So, well, uh, these are, again, resources, as I mentioned, that we have available for you. You can, I am I'm not too familiar on how you would reach out to the organization, just reach out to them, to the foundation, and they'll, I'm sure they'll, I'll make them available for you. And um, I would love to answer any questions if you have, if you guys have them. I don't know if I should now um, close the sharing of the screen. We are still on, yeah, we're right on time for the questions. So, Kristen, yes, I, Daniela. yes, Daniela. Yes, thank you, Daniela. Go ahead and uh, you can stop share. Okay. And uh, I believe you and I will now be on the screen.
So I do have some questions coming in today. Okay, um, one of the first ones that came in is uh, someone said, Vanil said, hi, thank you so much for this session. My son has minimal change disease. Can he have chicken? Chicken as a lean protein is a great product to have. Uh, for him, I don't know the age, I would check a value called a BUN. I'm sure you're familiar with the BUN with this doctor. And that would be the only thing to see if it's restricted. If not much restriction is needed, chicken is a great product to have in all aspects. Phosphorus amount is good. Sodium amount, you control it when cooking. And it's a re very, very good source of lean protein. Yes. Great, thank you. Margaret asked a question. Uh, my son has minimal change disease. We are told not to count sodium when eating fresh meat, veggies, and fruit. Is that correct? That is correct. The amount of um, sodium in fresh products is minimal. Um, and the most important for sodium, even though not even salt, as we said it, labels, processed food, packaged foods, even frozen foods. But if it's natural fruits, veggies, natural meats, and frozen fruits and veggies that, are, that come naturally, you don't need to monitor them. That's correct. Great. Um, we have one from Beth on Facebook. She is asking, if you have nephrotic syndrome, but it's being treated and you are no longer leaking protein and have normal labs, is it still important to follow a diet like this, a kidney-friendly diet? So the most important for the, a control non-leaking nephrotic syndrome would be the avoiding the high risk of the combined medications and nature of the disease. So for you, it's going to be focused on the heart health, fats and sugar. Those two are going to be crucial because you're going to have a natural tendency, even if your nephrotic syndrome is control to develop high cholesterol, high triglycerides, and to accumulate those products in your bloodstream that can worsen later your heart condition, your quality of life. So I would say those two in combination to a moderate to low sodium diet will be the key. You wouldn't need to monitor phosphorus and potassium and BUN if those are control. But then fats, sugar, and always sodium would be my, my go-to for this, for this case. Yeah. Great. I have another question from Talia on Facebook. She is asking, are, substitute, are sugar substitute drinks with aspartame or Splenda, like Crystal Light, for example, are they bad for kidney health? So, so far, no. And we don't have, this is a very good question, because again, this comes from a lot of chemical products. So do they accumulate? Do they worsen my condition? The research some so far suggests that they're not, they're not detrimental. So you can have them. And in comparison, I don't know your age. I'm going to assume you're an adult comparing the benefits and, and the, you know, and the risk of should I just do a substitute in a crystallite in a, in a sweetener versus a normal? I would go with the substitutes because all, overall they're going to give you more, yeah, they're going to give you more benefits than whatever worsening of the kidney that we're, some, we're not even sure yet compared to the higher sugar, higher, just higher fat overall things that you're going to find the regular product. So yes. Great. Um, Lisa asked um, in the webinar, the numbers that you're suggesting, um, you know, like the daily allowance of sodium or calories. Are there, are these amounts different for children rather than adults? You're breaking up on me. Can you, can you go again? Cause I, I yep. you broke up. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I saw you, I saw you freeze up. So Lisa is asking the numbers that you're suggesting the no, are they different for children than adults with nephrotic syndrome? Yeah. Yes, yes, completely different. And uh, children, children need to have an even more, more intense uh, care with a, with a, with a specialist because we want to manage, we want to restrict to protect the kidney, but we don't want to restrict too much to where we hinder the growth and the development, which is key. So in, in, in kids, you do have a very specific amount of everything and there it even goes more in detail if it's a girl or a boy. So that we have the ability to calculate and estimate these numbers and these recommendations for your child, yes. All right, um, another question uh, from, a, from someone on the webinar now. It says, I live an active lifestyle. Is it okay for me to drink Pedialyte to rehydrate or is that too much salt or potassium? 
So if you are compensating, compensating for a loss, I, I'm just trying to graphic it here. If you're compensating for a loss, you're going to go back to neutral, right? This is assuming you are a high endurance athlete and do you know how much you're losing. If it's just regularly active person, you go out, you run, you run 5Ks, you work at the gym, the, the specific need for you to replenish electrolytes is not too much and it, it's not real. A average good, good performance athlete does not need to replenish electrolytes unless you're an endurance runner or an endurance cycler or you're on the road for a long time or you sweat and you get dehydrated a lot. So if you're not one of those, I, I would say just go on with normal hydration and normal meals without replenishing it. If you're a higher endurance athlete, try to estimate a little bit of how much you work out. You can calculate, there are formulas to calculate. We can of course find resources for you for how much you, what type of exercise and how much your weight, your age, and that gives you an estimate of how much you lost, you lose and how much you need to replenish. So yeah. That's a great answer. Thank you. Great, great uh, information about endurance versus maybe just regular exercise. Yeah. So that's great. Um, another one, uh, m someone is asking, my current nephrologist wants me to drink water before I get my blood work done to make sure that I'm hydrated. If too, is, is too many fluids bad for me or should I not be doing this? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume again, if your, your doctor wants this, you may be a hard stick, which is sometimes makes it hard for the nurses to find your, your you know, an area, a good area to get it. And, um, but no, the amount of water that you can be drinking before a blood work to help them out, to find your veins, I don't think it's, 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 it's going to compromise. It's going to compromise it. And if it's your doctor who's regulating your, your blood work, and is asking you to do it, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking there is a problem with that. No. Great. Um, let's see here. Do you have any apps that you recommend for tracking food intake? Are there some that you like, Daniela? So the, my fitness pal is the one that I found most uh, detailed. It's a very good app that has, so it, it's actually a fitness, uh, fluid diet and workout a planner tracker and what i love is that you include you can now it's new so you can one scan a product if it's a if it's a commercial product you can just scan the label and put how much you ate it just goes right in there and then you can enter let's say you ate mid side i don't know half of a an apple a red apple it gives you a whole bunch of types of apples i don't even know how many apples existed before using this app but you can go on there and then after you put the meals it gives you a very specific numbering beautiful um, it gives you everything potassium phosphorus vitamins minerals so that is a really good app my fitness pal and that you can link now to to apple watch into your fitbit it, it goes it goes very well synced into other products Great, thank you. Um, Talia from Facebook also asked, is there a recommended daily amount of protein that should be consumed for patients with FSGS? There is so, some controversy, right, about should you limit protein or not limit protein? What is your take on that? So if you are not um, depleted in muscles, so if it's not taking a toll on your muscles, and your metabolism, we don't we don't replenish it because it's not going to make an effect. So we try to find you at the middle of the target where we're not replenishing it and we're not restricting it either. If you get a, an acute an acute uh, onset of the condition where it gets worse when it's less controlled, then we try to tighten it up. But for general, a good one gram per kilogram general rule of maybe 0.85 grams per, of protein per kilogram if you're an average adult is what we tend to go for without much restriction, yeah. Daniela, what about baking? Uh, Yvette is asking, do you recommend coconut sugar or maple syrup or maybe another alternative as a way to bake more healthy? Well, this for, for a personal experience and it's worked wonderfully for me, I use dates which is, well, dates, the fruits, and you can just buy them pit, like pitted without the, the little bone inside, the little thing, seed. So you soak them in, this is great, and my sister get me this advice. You soak them in warm water, or 
I don't know, a whole day, you put it in the, you put it in the fridge later. You take them out. Once you take them out, you just peel them up, you blend them and you can put that in the fridge for a week. And it's literally a puree of sugar coming naturally from a super high fiber product, which is not even that much. It's not even that high in sugar and it's great for flavor. So that it's sweet, but numerically the sugar is not that much and the fiber is great. So I would say my very best favorite product to bake sh with sugar alternative is gonna be dates. And after that, coconut sugar, it, it changes a lot when, with baking. It's better for raw cooking. And I would use either that or um, monk fruit. It's very new and it's, it's, it works very well with baking and the flavor doesn't get altered that much, yeah. Daniela, what about a vegan diet? Uh, Audrey has FSGS, and she's wondering if you if you think there would be any problems following a vegan diet. If you uh, no, not necessarily, and a vegan diet can be very healthy as well. Mind you, vegan diets are uh, very high, and the only product that they're going to be very high in is in, is in phosphorus, right? And sometimes when we're new to a vegan diet, we tend to overeat processed foods. Uh, we tend to go to a lot of like the vegan already made tofu or, you know, the vegan patties, the vegan sausages, vegan mayo, vegan, vegan, whatever. They're really good products. They're healthy. They're vegan, but they're very processed. And in processing the overall for my, for you and I, for kidney, a vegan diet can be very high in phosphorus because it's very much processed and very high in sodium as well. So those two things, if you don't have problems with phosphorus and you wanna venture into a vegan diet, you can do it and it's possible. A lot of label reading. Other than that, I don't see, I don't see major problem. Very healthy diet. Great. Dan from Facebook is asking, if you decide to have a cheat day and gain water weight because of that, is there something you can do to help drop that added weight? No, unfortunately, no. And uh, yes, the answer, the plain answer is going to be no. Again, the next day, the only thing that I, I would recommend is be even lower in sodium, eat, like just minimize it completely. And if you, if you overdid it, let's say you're going to go out on Saturday night, try to follow a very strict, natural, plain diet on the day, mostly fruits and veggies, very low, very low processed foods, very low cooked, high cooked animal foods. And then the next day as well, so that you try to just flush it out naturally, if, depending on you pee, if you don't pee, it, it depends, right? But try to compensate it with a minimal amount of sodium as you can, minimal to zero, that would be. Another question, uh Vanille has uh, about his son who has minimal change disease. Um, he's four years old. Can you suggest the best fruit? Are there some that you would suggest more than others? So the best fruit for kids and flavor, nutrient, everything, it's all the family of the berries. They work very well with uh, a lot. They're very versatile. You can use them for cooking. You can make jellies out of them. You can give them raw. You, you can make uh, you can blend them and put them on the freezer and then use them as, as, you know, as little ice creams for them. But berries are very low in potassium. They're very versatile with, with they're very good with flavors and kids tend to like them a lot. And another one, tangerines are really good as well. And I would just go with plain apples, but my very favorite are the berries. Yeah. <laughs> a little bias here. I like them a lot. Yeah. Are there any, uh, could you comment, uh, Payam asked us in the webinar, could you comment on any specific restrictions for IgA nephropathy? Other than watching your protein limits, I, I, I wouldn't say there is any different suggestions. It, it would only be knowing very much, if, if we're gonna focus on the numbers, focusing very much on the numbers of protein and knowing where your protein is coming from in your diet. And, uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same, the same guidelines, yes. Great. Um, Yvette is asking, she has a daughter who's three years old. Um, she takes cyclosporin to manage her protein in the urine, and she's doing well, has normal labs right now. Is there anything that you recommend uh, to keep her healthy? She's mainly vegetarian. Is meat or fish important? What about milk? Should she encourage her to drink more milk? So at three, with her condition, the, the first thing I'm going to think is the restriction of height, right? So kids with this condition and this age are going to tend to be shorter 
and I'm, are, are going to need a lot of attention to them meeting their protein needs. Doing it vegetarian or vegan, it's, it makes it harder. And this is not related. So growth and nutrition does not relate directly to the protein loss. They're going to lose it and it's going to look low in the labs. Albumin is going to be almost always low in the labs. But if I'm giving a, the sufficient amount, I am going to see it in two things, the growth, the height, and a, a value that you can ask your doctor for is called NPCR, important numbers for her or him, sorry. So for, for I, I, I think you said a daughter, for her, Animal protein for me would be an important addition, maybe not a red meat, but maybe fish would be good and, uh, and chicken, good lean versions of it. And milk, I wouldn't even, no, no need. If she doesn't do it already, don't even mind it, no. Daniela, Mary K, Maria K is asking on Facebook, her son has minimal change, he is currently relapsing. Um, do, what are your thoughts on a gluten-free diet? So a gluten-free diet, if anything, can have an effect in an overall inflammatory state if your child is sensitive to gluten. Other than that, a gluten-free diet has no benefits on a renal disease patient, but by, by elimination, when you do gluten-free, there's a lot of grain products that you're not gonna consume. So the products that you're left with that are gluten-free are lower in phosphorus. That would be the only thing. But gluten-free as in the inflammation and the process itself shouldn't have a relationship in, into helping the condition other than limiting the amount of phosphorus, yeah. And then Beth is asking from Facebook, um, she heard you mention something about avocado um, she's wondering what type of fat would you recommend? Is an avocado not a good fat? Is her question. So avocado is a really good fat. And then I do recommend, you guys need fat. If you're still controlling it and you want to have a, a heart healthy diet, you still need the fat and you need the good ones. And I would recommend mostly avocado. Again, super biased, but avocado is great. Nuts and seeds with, with a lot of monitoring to your phosphorus if you have to be a restricted on them. If you don't, nuts and seeds are great. Nuts and seed butters are really good as well. If the more than the, the natural, the better. Read out the labels, watch for the sodium. You don't want sodium. You can, you can look for naturally roasted and not salted roasted, just naturally roasted peanuts or almonds. Those are really good. And, um, and then the forms of oil you use for cooking, maybe instead of a regular vegetable oil, go for olive oil, soft flour oil, canola oil even works well. And, uh, coconut oil can work as well. So those kind of good fats are always, they're always gonna be the best for you. So Daniela, I have, I have two, I think, quick questions for you and then our time will be over for today. Um, one, uh, Genevieve was asking, she has FSGS and she experiences swelling um, in her lower extremities. Is there a guideline for salt intake? And then the second one is from Andrea, She's asking if, if you do, if you are on a 2000 calorie diet, then would the percentages on the label be accurate? If you can answer kind of both of those. Yeah, yeah. So the percentages will be accurate for a 2000 calorie diet a day. And uh, it's going to be very easy. If that's your calorie goal, it's going to be very easy for you to find general healthy guidelines online on what is considered low fat. They're going to tell you below 10%. What is considered low sugar? Below 5%. And those things go straight if you have a 2,000 calorie diet. And for the other question, um, the sodium, if, if you're experiencing a lot of swelling, I don't know how much your current intake is, I would go straight for a 1,500. It, um, again, assuming, well, you're female, you're an adult, 1,500 could be a very good number to start to see if it's if it's too much or too little, but that would be a, a, a fair number. And um, 1200 could even be could even be a, a good option for you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, we did uh, we are out of time for today. I do want to thank you. I want to let you know there are some questions um, about uh, you know certain you know proteins, the phosphorus, the, the sodium content, that sort of thing. Nescure does have uh, some pocket guides that we've recently made around diet and nutrition. So we will be uploading those to our, if they are up currently, the sodium one is up on our website. If you guys would like to check that out, Kylie is going to actually post a link 
um, in the uh, comments on the Facebook page, on our Facebook page to this webinar, so that you can link to this pocket guide for sodium. We will be soon uploading uh, one for phosphorus and potassium as well, so be on the look for that. Um, Daniela, there is uh, another question about an oxalate diet. I might just reach out to you offline so I can get that yeah. those resources back to Starfire. She did ask those questions too. So Starfire, I'll get that resource to you. Um, and then besides that, I just wanna thank you so much, Daniela, for being here today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. You can, if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint that Daniela presented today, you can email Rebecca Cook at rcook at nefcure.org and she would be happy to send that to you if you would like to review it. Um, there is a lot of great resources in there, Daniela, so thank you for that. Thank we you. will also be uploading this video webinar to our YouTube channel as well as it will be on our Facebook page, so you can always find it there as well. Um, at this time, I'd like to say thank you again um, to our sponsors and, uh, you know, feel free to email us and we'll, if you have any further questions, we can try to get those to Daniela as well. Daniela, thank thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You have a great day, okay? Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.